Hoy yo presentar en eh, español. Muy bien. I'm just kidding. I'm not gonna... <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to be presenting to you today uh, on Murray Rothbard's book, the chapter titled The Roots of Marxism, Messianic Communism. And for this, specifically, I want you to envision my scarf as representing the attire of a professional religious <laughs> person. Uh, to, to give you the idea that communism really did begin with a religious component to it. Um, what I'm going to be essentially presenting to you today is focusing on the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries of communist history, which all the way up uh, just before Karl Marx, the most famous communist I would say there is, and the founder, of course, of Marxism. Okay, now let's begin. So I'm going to be talking about four major focuses, early communism, then going into the secularized, secularized millennial communism, the conspiracy of equals, and the burgeoning communism. Now, Murray Rothbard begins this chapter with stating that for centuries, the alleged ideal of communism had come to the world as a messianic and millennial creed. What this messianic and millennial creed is claiming is that there is going to be a deliverance, a liberation, a salvation that communism will bring to the community. And it's, 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 it's a beautiful idea. Um, and this is where the religious component really helped strengthen the communist argument, was that the um, religious communists could justify their egalitarian religion of communism by saying, hey, this is the salvation that Jesus is talking about. This is what he's going to bring to us. It's going to be a society, utopian society, of complete equality. And it's going to be peaceful. And th these are the essential components of the communist ideal. Um, Joaquim of, of Fjord was uh, an original communist in the 17th century and stated that um, the final state of mankind is one of perfect harmony and equality. And as we'll go into, uh, these communists, they really were big on equality, but as an anarchist like myself, the concept of equality doesn't make sense to me. I mean, you don't even see equality amongst the same species. Look at plants. There are different sizes, let alone they, they change at different rates. Um, and they have different variations in their branches and, and such, even geography. You have coastal regions, you have mountainous regions. Equality amongst people can only be applied to our species, we're humans. We are not uh, the same in our features, both externally and internally. We have different aptitudes in life. And this is not something to shame, but yet this is a, a characteristic that communists are big on shaming. And, um, also in the 16th century, we had the Anabaptist wing of the Reformation. And then we had, um, during the English Civil War, the Protestant sects. And this is really what I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, the Protestant sects consisted of the Diggers, the Ranters, and the Fifth Monarchy of Men. So Gerard Winstanley, the first figure, was the founder of the Digger movement. And he also wrote many pamphlets espousing mystical messianism and the pantheistic view of God who decreed cooperation. But for William Stanley, what cooperation meant was compulsory communism. Cooperation did not mean freedom and laissez-faire in the marketplace of society, no, no, no. It was compulsion that we needed in order to achieve the societal goal of cooperation. 
As well, when Stanley made the argument that in England, that England enjoyed communism prior to the Norman Conquest in 1066. So when Stanley was making the argument that we should revert to the society of England prior to uh, 1066 because they had communism, and with the conquest, they established private property. Of course, to a communist, private property is the root of all evil. As well as in the law of freedom, in a platform, or a true magistrate restored, a pamphlet written by Winston Stanley, he envisioned a large agrarian society in which all goods would be communally owned and where all wage, labor, and trade would be outlawed. So this is the concept of the diggers. They were essentially a cult. Uh, in the form of an egalitarian movement, and what they envisioned was homesteading wasted barren land in England. And what they would construct is communist societies, and they would be so prosperous and, 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 and harmonious that they would attract people living in the city side to come out to their um, homesteaded area, and this will be a place where they don't use money. And what happened was they were met with extreme contempt from the English. Um, and they had uh, like about 100 people uh, in, in their homesteading area. And they had like 30 of these little sets um, throughout England, but they weren't successful. I, I wonder why. Now, in the secularized millennial communism, we begin to see the divergence of some communist thinkers trying to stray away from the religious side of communism and develop a more secularized side. And the two, or well, I'll get to that. But um, the communists really, in the 18th century, late 18th century, took the energy from the French Revolution, which, you know, as we know, the French Revolution was just bloody and horrendous and much more vile than, than we're taught in uh, public education sectors. But um, essentially, the secularized communists were met with the problem. The problem was, for the Christian millennials, um, they had the agency of Jesus and the deliverance of salvation to bring in the communist society. So, for the premillennialists, the agent would be the second advent of Jesus Christ. And for the postmillennialists, the agents would be the prophets or the vanguard groups um, who would await Jesus' eventual return. These are you know, going to be the leaders of the idealized communist society. And so for the secularized com communists, that was their problem, was how are we going to bring communism to the people? What is our agency if we don't have Jesus and, and these religious figures? What are we going to do? So they look towards education. They look towards exhortation. They also consider, you know, just a nice bloody revolution, something light for the people. Um, and what followed were two major secularized communist thinkers. One of which is Gabriel Bonnet de Mably. He was a French aristocratic writer uh, in the 18th century, and his focus was on all men being perfectly equal and uniform. And they're one and the same everywhere. Uh, they just love equality. They can't get away from it. And he justified this by saying the truths are to be found in the laws of nature. Um, I love that. We, we will see how most of these communists base their findings on the laws of nature. It's just part of nature that everything is equal. So maybe we, of course, came up against the problem of incentives in the communist utopia. And this issue of, of, of uh, incentives in communism looks, you know, something like if everyone's equal, we all get our equal parcels of land, which includes our equal parcels of food and shelter and such. And what this means is, is essentially people aren't born equal, but people are made equal in outcome. So it's really an in, in, in if-then conclusion, which is that if all property is communally owned, 
then incentives for labor is absent. And the reason for this is because community provides for the individual and not the individual providing for the community. So it's a really reverse uh, dynamic than what we witness in spontaneous order. Spontaneous order being the idea that it is the individuals through the marketplace of ideas and goods and services that come together to spontaneously create order in a societal marketplace. But under communism, people already belong to the community without bringing anything into it. So you have this, this dynamic of nothing ever being created or produced because there's no reason to. The whole mentality of the human nature and spirit is completely distorted. And this distortion creates the result of uh, a communistic society, which, as we know, I don't want to go into detail at the moment. This is more of a history um, presentation. So the solutions that, that Mabley proposed was, of course, well, people could just want less. The Spartan austerity, they tighten their belts. They just receive, this is the same argument that um, with Kim Jong-il uh, made when they had like a famine. They said, well, really we're gonna go from three meals a day to two meals a day was one of the kings. And um, of course, unfortunately, yeah, you know, you know how. So, um, as well, he developed the idea of what came to be called by Mao Zedong, moral incentives. And this idea is just incredible because for these communists who praise the idea of moral incentives, is that um, they're gonna distinct, they're gonna make more distinctions for people. We're gonna give people, you know, little pins and ribbons. Uh, th this will incentivize people to work. So the more distinctions people earn from working hard in the communist society, the less they distinguish. It's it's um, it's incredible. The more the more distinctions, the less they. I I I just can't even wrap my head around it. So it's art. Why not use money? To, to use as an incentive for people. But of course, in communism, you can't. We don't have money. That's um, another root of the devil and evil, is money and property. And the last point was that maybe was was considered a realist or a pessimist on human nature. He said, you know, this communist idea is great and all, but people are just not gonna act in the way we want them to. And he was more or less, um, open to leaving people to their voluntary actions. And so in this sense, he was a, a pessimist on communism. Now, the other major secularized communist thinker was Etienne Gabriel Morelli. And Morelli was quite the opposite. Morelli was an optimist on human nature, but his optimism was not that we need to leave people alone or not. People need a little encouragement, a little push to be a communist person. What they need is brutal coercive methods in the society to, to keep our good citizens in line. Just a little check, uh, just a little check on them. Um, nothing much, just a little brutal coercion. So he wrote The Code of Nature in 1755, and he really had the perspective that there's just no doubts of anything going wrong in a communist society. People are not lazy, people don't have incentives, or at least negative ones. Um, the real issue is private property. And God dang it, these people who created private property have corrupted man. Well, who created private property? Well, man, of course. Um, so he also observed that in a communist society, when it comes to how it operates, he, he reflected on the administration component to be me, merely a matter of trivial enumeration. And obviously this inspired uh, Marx and Lenin to just brush over the administrative aspect of allocating resources in communism. Turned out there was a bit of an issue with that. 
Um, and I want to read you what Rothbard writes regarding the points of morality because it's just absurd, but, but worth noting. In particular, there is to be no private property except for daily needs. Every person is to be maintained and employed by the collective. Every man is to be forced to work, to contribute to the communal storehouses according to his talents, and will then be assigned goods from these stores according to his needs, to be brought up communally and absolutely identical in food, clothing, and training. Philosophic and religious doctrines are to be absolutely prescribed. No differences are to be tolerated, and children are not to be corrupted by any fable, story, or ridiculous fictions. All buildings must be the same, and grouped in equal blocks. All clothing is to be made out of the same fabric. Occupations are to be limited and strictly assigned by the state. Finally, these laws are to be sacred and inviolable, and anyone attempting to change them is to be isolated and incarcerated for life. And I have to appreciate, I have to appreciate the meticulous aspects of equality the communists strain themselves on. Every clothes must have the same fabric. That's, 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 I love thinking that. These are some, like, very interesting, deranged ideas. But, um, anyways, Mabley and Morelli, just a quick little comparison of, of them, both reuse uh, nature and natural laws as their justification. So these dudes were practically scientists. I mean, it's nature, it's natural, this is science, what science is about, it's nature. And, uh, and, uh, um, Yes, these are just points I went over. Also, uh, around the same time we had the, the Christian millennialism, the other side of the communist um, division of, of the religious side and the atheist side, the secularized side. And essentially, Louis Claude de Saint Marie was the main figure in the apocalyptic Christian movement, the Masonic movement. And this, this Christian millennialism had great speed to its movement. And one of these movements was the Rosicrucian movement, which claimed that the third and final age of history, the age of the Holy Spirit, would be the new communal world ruled by the illuminated elect, the Rosicrucian order. And you, you just have to wonder, like, in this equal society, who is this illuminated elect? And really, as we'll see, this is the whole idea of communism, is we're gonna have equality for all, uh, for thee and not for me. I'm gonna, you guys need a little organization. Obviously, I'm the only one capable of doing that. So, I'll just be like a little bit more equal than you guys. Um, yes, and, and in the late 18th century, we see the Prussian King Frederick William II uh, was converted to Rosicrucianism, communism, and as well as the Russian Tsar Paul I converted to Rosicrucianism in the late 1790s. Now we get into in the 18th century of communism, the conspiracy of equals. And I'll be honest, myself, I like conspiracy theories. I think there are great ways to pass the time with interesting theories. And this is a, a very interesting theory, if I do say so myself. What the conspiratorial revolution, or what the conspiracy of equals was, was a conspiratorial revolutionary organization to establish communism, of course. And their main priorities were obtaining absolute and perfect equality, perfection. Very difficult to make anything perfect in the world. Um, the founder of this secret conspiracy was Frank Cois Noel Babu. Babu. And he was a journalist. He wrote a. He, he, he founded a journal that was called the Tribune, Tribune of the People which was a revolutionary journal. Um, as a matter of fact, it was you know, very propagandistic. Uh, it had much more than a bias, they had an agenda. And I love the use of the terminology of people. 
myself as an anarchist studying Austrian economics, I think what I study applies to people and may in some sense help people, but no, 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 the communists, they're explicitly for the people. So I guess they're more for the people than I am because of the words they use. Um, as well in the Plebeian Manifesto, which Babouf wrote, he called for complete revolutionary activity and also moved towards Christian messianism. And um, what this revolutionary activity composed of was, was, was a completion of the French Revolution um, that was the poor must rise up and sack the rich. And um, he said everything must turn into chaos. And out of this chaos will emerge the new and regenerated world. Um, so he was probably advocating for a little bit of violence in society, a very humanitarian of him. A follower of Babouf was Sylvain Marchal, who wrote the Manifesto of Equals. And it's a little bit more radical. He called for real equality or death. Um, Uh, an interesting aspect to this conspiracy of equals was they had a large focus on militarism and you know this was really the, the, the foundation ideas of professional revolutionaries and these ideas of militarism by Babouf were that we could create a military and either they can occupy a said area and expand outwards or they could just be designated to, I guess, always fighting in a, in a, for, for revolution, for communism. So the communists were not the most peaceful. They were openly advocating for potentially violent means to achieve their ends. And I think to be in this time to, to witness these ideas would be pretty remarkable. Um, but as well, there's a couple paradoxes here uh, that I will mention again, which were that they were going to initiate a revolution to end all revolutions, and that they were going to have a hierarchy of an all-powerful absolute leaders, um, because this would be necessary to end all hierarchies. And of course, these would be established indefinitely, forever. Um, in 1796, uh, after suffering police repression, the conspiracy of equals, um, they, they constituted themselves as the secret directory of public safety. Um, public safety, it's a beautiful cover term for any communist group and Actually, if you'll allow me this digression, there's a, a good book written by Belladot called The School of Darkness. And it was essentially stating that in the 1930s, her and many other devout communists infiltrated the schools in New York and, and across the United States as a means to achieve their ideological revolution of implanting the ideas of communism into the students the, of the public education sector in the United States. So to enter and infiltrate into the public sector, as we see here, of public safety is not something unfamiliar to communists. They're very much open for obtaining positions in governments to achieve their, their ends. Now you have the true believers. True believers, also known as the useful idiots, think that what they believe in is actually going to achieve peace and harmony and equality. But really, what they're useful for is the people containing, as St. Augustine said, libido dominante, or the lust for power. These people were just like the psychopaths that run politics of today's world, power hungry. 
Now we get into actually a descendant of Michelangelo, and this is Filippo Giuseppe Maria Lavoro, and he was a follower of Morelli and a member of Babu's conspiracy peoples. He was considered to be the first professional revolutionist. He actually fought against forces of Italy in the French Revolution. So he was no stranger to war in what it consists of, in one of the most uh, horrendous wars in human history. And he also, after the French Revolution, wrote The Conspiracy for Equality of Babus. And this was more or less a, a dedication to Babouf and his ideas. And this sold a lot of copies. I think over 50,000 copies. Um, and even the, in, in, in a couple of years, uh, all across Europe. Um, again, Buon Marotti it really tried to establish the idea for an iron elite rule immediately after the coming to power of the revolutionary forces. And what he states is that the people are incapable either of regeneration by themselves or designating the people who should direct the regeneration. And this is a contradiction I think Mises points out about democracy and human action. He says that, well, you know, they say that, okay, I forget what Mises says, but essentially the idea is that people are incapable of knowing what's best for them. So we need people who know what's best for the people to be established in these powerful positions, designating them. Um, and yeah, I just, I just personally admire, in a Machiavellian sense, the capabilities these communists can put forth to achieve their ends and the justification. You have to remember, for the left and the communists, hypocrisy, as Curtis Yarvin says, hypocrisy is their mother's milk. If you point out a contradiction to them, they will not only not acknowledge the contradiction you're stating that they're in, but they will use that as justification for the validity of what they're advocating for. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite something in the minds of, of, of these people, and I think it speaks to what human beings are capable of, just holding contradictory simultaneous thoughts in the mind. Okay, this is the last section, bear with me. We get into the burgeoning of communism. Here we have Etienne Comet. Here we have Wilhelm Whiting. And then here we have John Goodwin Barney. And here we have Theodore Desmond. Now, beginning with Etienne, Etienne Cabet, Cabet. Uh, he wrote a work titled The Voyage in Icaria, and he created this Icarian movement of communists. And in this work, in 1839, he was the first person, um, or, or, or the first work to use the term communist, and it was a very popular work. And a, the first sentence in the Communist Manifesto states that Well, it states essentially that the word communism swept across Europe and that it did um, Following Habet We had this group called the League of Outlaws in Paris and Well, they were an international organization um, of communist revolutionaries. What happened was they lasted for about four years, and then they turned into the League of Just. And the League of Just was a German communist group that um, tended to be more Christian 
then the, the, the secularized or um, atheist uh, communist groups. So, in 1839, the League of Justice moved to London and established the Educational Society for German Working Men. And one member, okay, so Karl Schaffer was the leader of the League of Just, and there was a prominent member, and this prominent member was Wilhelm Well. Okay. Uh, so, I guess the most important note about this was that in the League of Outlaws, they originally had about 100 members from 1834 to 1838. But from 1840, when the Educational Society for German Working Men was established, in the span of seven years, by 1847, they had 1,000 members which was a significant increase. So, one of the last religious communist members was John Goodwin Barnaby. He was an English Christian leader of the communist movement, and he spread the word, communist. At the time, that word was very popular. Um, he also founded a communist propaganda society, which was the Universal Communitarian Society. Um, he established the journal, the Promethean or Communitarian Apostle, and it soon became renamed to the Communist Chronicle. When Whiteling arrived in London in 1844, um, Barnaby and Whiteling began to collaborate, and both of them were Christian communists. Uh, but by 1847, they began to lose out because the communist movement was shifting decisively towards atheism. And actually, what happened was Barnaby, Whiteley, and Cabet all moved to the United States. And um, so they eventually died. But really, they voted with their feet to join a more prosperous society, I suppose, in the United States. So I think that's an interesting point. Um, yeah, yeah, Barnaby, he became a national communist uh, and a revolutionary nationalist. And essentially, you just got to remember that these Christian communists, they failed. They lost. Okay? Because what happened was this dude, Theodore De Desime, came in and he completely dismantled this religious idea and he kicked it to the curb. And he said, you know what? We're atheists in this communist society. I'm a follower of Quebec, but damn it, he wrote a work despising Quebec in his work, Slanders and Politics of Mr. Quebec. And really, he was perhaps the founder of the Marxist Len Leninist tradition of ideological and political excommunication. And that is exactly what he did. He looked at Quebec, who was essentially his mentor in communism, and he gave him the finger. And he wrote, he just excommunicated him. And this is a wonderful idea for the communists, for just excommunicating, I mean, it's not wonderful. But it's, it's useful. It's a useful idea because you can completely rewrite the history of your, you, you just have this ability to, to um, continuously change what, what your position stands for. And when you're in the ideology of complete contradictions and and then critical actions, it's very useful to be able to change the justification of um, what you're proposing. So, if you'll allow me one last digression. Um, Freda Utley, she was a writer and devoted to the 
the, the Soviets, uh, Soviet Union and, and communism. So much so, she married a communist, and in about her late in her 30s, she moved to the Soviet Union with her husband. Um, then the revolution of 1917 occurred, shit went crazy, and her husband disappeared. She even had a baby with this man. And she returned to the US, and she went to her friends, and she asked them for help. And all her friends said, do I know you? Who is this person who's not a supporter of the Soviet Union? And this, this broke her. But this is what communism is about. You're either with us or you're against us. And then you get sent to the gulag. Um, but Desmond, he... Uh, well, beginning with the last point, Desmond was a revolutionary, and he said that specific or gradual measures must be rejected. Um, and not only would revolutionary communism be immediate and total, it would also be global and universal. And in fact, um, he was greatly admired by Marx, and he stated regarding revolution that swift and total change would be less bloody than a slow process, since communism releases the natural goodness of man. The natural goodness, there we go again, nature. Uh, This meant also because they no longer, like the secularists, had the agency of religion uh, to deliver them to a communist utopia. So, so what they adopted was science. And Desmet attempted to claim that, that communism was both rational and inevitable. But as Mises pointed out, that just because something is inevitable doesn't make it moral. Um, I think, I think that's what he says. Uh, but but uh, Marx and Engels and others, after Desmond adopted this idea of establishing communism as scientific, and that's where we get the term scientific socialism. And um, this was a point I skipped over, but uh, back in 1847, the League of Just, combined with the Communist Correspondence Committee, which was a 50-man group led by Karl Marx, and they merged to form the Communist League. And this was the historical foundation that Karl Marx was given to create communism in the more seen sense. Thank you very much. is not something that I've called it, but this is the concept of the cathedral. And the cathedral is a concept created by Curtis Yarvin. I don't know if he's familiar with Curtis Yarvin, but would you write his name? Yeah. Um, Curtis Yarvin, he literally read all of Mises and Rothbard, and I, he just, I really like how he thinks. And so the cathedral, what it consists of is three components. And these components are the state, the 
the universities. And then the last one, the name changes. But the, the corporate press or the institutional press. And for libertarians, their main focus is on the state, the issues of the state. But I think in, in, in today's world, to combat the ideas of communism and such, is realizing that, that the main enemies here are the universities and the mass mainstream media. Because the universities indoctrinate kids. So they take them at a young age and they put them in the mold of ideologies of how to think. Well, they're not so young. Well, I mean, I'll admit that when I was in the university, I was a kid. I mean, that wasn't. I, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to think for yourself when you're getting blasted with communist ideologies and university. I'll talk about this. Not really start in high school or elementary school. Yeah, yeah, they take kids. Uh, and I like this. This is what my so would it not be like the right education system instead of university. Yeah, yeah. The universities specifically train um, students to, you know, on the college application essay, every student writes, "I want to make a difference." And what they're saying is essentially, "I want power. Give me power." Um, that's what making a difference is in the world. And with the educational system, this is a point Michael Malice makes, is what public education does, is it says, well, we're just making good citizens. And what good citizens is a euphemism for is taking children and making them obedient, submissive, and docile. And you kill their creative energy, you outsource their, 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 self-esteem to the person in the front of the classroom, and the person standing in the front of the classroom is a mediocre person at best. It's a horrible Prussian invention, the educational public educational system. It also teaches people, you know, to praise democracy as the greatest invention of all time, as Hans Hoppe says. Um, so you're training students from kids to praise democracy and to vote. That's my get a headache every four years. It's so crazy. You're training people to be many dictators through this system. Now what the corporate press does is after you graduate, they basically present to you an issue simultaneously with the solution of how to think about the issue. So you feel simultaneously informed and educated about the proper means to address the given issue. And, and, and they incorporate fear, and the only solutions they present are just obviously more government involvement. Um, there's not many, you know, the retirement, major news networks. So these are really the enemies of the people. Um, and this, without the technological revolution of TVs and mass communication through the internet, I don't think, at least this third component, would be as effective to getting mass support for the state as it currently does. But why is it, why is it called the cathedral? The cathedral. Uh, it's called the cathedral because it's this magnificent organization that's. I mean, I think I don't know. I don't know. I don't know my Catholic history, but I, I, I think it's because like the Catholic Church has reigned supreme historically for so long that it was like this, this massive organization and it just refers to that like mass powerful um, place in society 